So we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, and then we will uh, we'll go from there. So again, if you happen to be cooking along with us, kick your ovens on to 350 degrees, pull out your chicken and pull out your goat cheese, and then we will go from there. If not, I'll just, uh, just watch as we cook along. We can talk, we can have some great conversation. So uh, I'm gonna start by introducing myself. My name is Brandon Collins. I am a chef. Um, I am a father of two, and I also have a little uh, fur baby who's eight months old. He's not little anymore, but he is uh, Diesel. He is a French pit bull. Um, absolute uh, love and ham and gets along extremely well with my kids, um, but they are here. So you may hear them in the background um, yelling at each other, beating each other up, doing all that fun stuff. <laughs> so just a fair warning. Um, I am a corporate chef. Um, I work for a company by the name of Unilever, and I'm also a mustard sommelier. Um, and another real quick tidbit about myself is since the pandemic started, I've lost 90 pounds. Um, and I did it by changing my diet and changing how I eat my relationship with food. Um, so that's some of the things we're going to talk about uh, today as we go through the dish that, that I've selected. I am here with Lewis Hughes, who is going to be our host um, today. He's a very dear friend of mine, an accomplished chef in his own right. Um, and also able to answer any questions you may have. So please feel free, come off mute. If you have any questions, let's have a conversation, a chat. If you wanna have your camera on, feel free to. If you don't, understandable as well. Um, and I will go ahead and let Lewis tell you a little bit about himself as well. Uh, hello everyone, um, Lewis Hughes, um, a chef uh, just like Brandon. Actually, um, I had been cooking for some years before I met Brandon and I ended up working under him um, as his sous chef. Um, I'd say about about nine years ago, eight, about nine, nearly ten years yep. ago. Um, yep. I learned a lot from him, and and I was already on my path, but he really helped to galvanize that. He's a very passionate chef. Um, I'm originally from the Washington D.C. area, but I live um, up up in the New York area um, with him um, in the same area. But I, being from D.C., I I was I have a Southern upbringing. Um, so my mom is from North Carolina, my dad is from Kentucky. So I learned Southern food really really young. I guess I roasted my first pig at, at 11. Um, so just doing that kind of food. Um, I also have uh, fur babies or fur and feather babies. I have two dogs, both mutts. Uh, I have two cats, both rescues, all four rescues. And then we have three chickens. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm full of them as well. Um, but again, if you have any questions, you can leave them to me. He's going to be cooking. I'm here to help answer any questions that uh, he's unable to. So just shoot away and ask away and talk away if you feel feel comfortable to. And welcome. Perfect. Awesome. So what we are going to cook today is we are going to make spaghetti squash with goat cheese and kale, some sauteed chicken. Um, and we're going to do that with a little bit of pickled peppers. And kind of the reason why uh, this whole dish kind of came about and the whole series that that you're, you may be seeing with within your own system as well is uh, I work with a company by the name of Sheft. And uh, basically what we do is we, we bring different companies together with chefs like me and Lewis um, and some of my other friends, Chef Dana and Chef Alvaro that you may be seeing as, as we go through uh, uh, the year together. And the idea is that uh, we're looking to kind of help create healthy habits, right? How can we uh, make easy dishes in the kitchen that are very quick, that can feed a lot of people in a very uh, timely manner. Um, and also something that you can grab and take to work with you as well, right? You're on your feet for 18 hours a day. You don't necessarily always have time to create the healthiest meal for yourself. Um, and this helps with that. If you want to meal prep on the weekends, uh, things along that line. And here come all of my kids through the kitchen now. Um, and <laughs> it allows you to, uh, to do this, keep it healthy, keep it flavorful, keep it fun. And by, and at the end of the day, just kind of play around with what it is that you have. So we have a spaghetti squash right here. Um, and the beauty about spaghetti squash is that it's extremely high in fiber. It's a very nutrient dense food. And the two main vegetables that we're working with today are very nutrient dense, which basically means that they give you way more than they do in the low amount of calories that they have, right? So high in fiber, potassium, uh, vitamin C as well. And fiber is also great anytime you're talking about trying to keep yourself full, right? Um, so how can we do that without carbs and without some of the other things? Though our body needs carbs as, as the day goes on, um, it doesn't help to kind of cut them out where we can. We would never cut them out completely um, as that can serve to be kind of a, a, a very dangerous thing to do um, unless you have to 
you know, do it for certain reasons. But anyways, so we have our spaghetti squash here. We are going to split this in half. So we're gonna split it this way. So one of the things that we wanna make sure that we do, especially with spaghetti squash, we wanna make sure we have a knife, a long knife, a sharp knife, all right, with a point. Because if it's dull, it's not really gonna kind of dig into the spaghetti squash. We're gonna shoot this down right into the center. Right? You don't have to force it all the way in. You don't have to push it all the way down because what's gonna end up happening is we're going to put our hand here and we're gonna slide this backwards, right? And go straight down. Then we're gonna flip it over and do the exact same thing. So that way it's split in half completely. And we have our seeds in the center, just like we would a regular pumpkin. And we are gonna scoop these out. We're gonna do that with a spoon and right onto a plate or into a bowl or whatever you may have floating around. Um, and the cool thing about this is you could very easily take this, put it into water, uh, get those seeds out, and you could then uh, roast these seeds like you would a pumpkin seed, right? So that will give you texture if you want. So if you wanna do this one day as a salad, right? You don't wanna to top it with chicken. Uh, you don't wanna put the kale in it, whatever that may be. You don't like goat cheese but this gives you something else you can do. You can take these, you can toast them, a little bit of salt and pepper and oil in like a 300 degree oven for about uh, 25 to 30 minutes until they're nice and crunchy. Let them cool down and then you can very easily uh, chop, eat those, enjoy them and um, they're absolutely delicious. So we've taken that center out completely. We are going to then take these spaghetti squash. We're gonna season them with a little bit of salt and pepper. So just a small pinch. And again, I use a Himalayan pink salt. Uh, it's one of the things that I don't like iodized salt, uh, mainly just because I don't like the flavor of it. Um, and if you eat or use a sea salt, there are minerals in there that haven't been stripped out um, that are good for you at the end of the day, right? So in a little bit of pepper, making sure that whenever you season, you season from above. If you season extremely close, you're gonna get these little clumps of salt. That's not fun, right? Same with the pepper. So the higher up, you get a little bit on your cutting board, that's perfectly fine, sweep it off onto the floor uh, and sweep it up later on or sweep it off into your hand, whichever one works better for you. So we're gonna take these down, flesh side down, and we're gonna put about two cups of water into this pan. And that's just gonna help steam them as it goes through the roasting process. So, and that way it doesn't kind of burn or uh, overcook um, on one side of it and not on the other. So again, right into the oven. 350 degrees, and this is gonna take about 20 minutes just until the outside of it is tender. Any questions at that stage or? <laughs> All right, perfect. Uh, awesome. Sorry, I had to go on mute for a second. My, uh, my puppy and my oldest are arguing with each other, I guess is probably the best way to put it. <laughs> All right, so the next thing that we are going to do, and they're still arguing with each other. <laughs> the next thing we are going to do is we are going to take our chicken breast, right? So we have our, uh, our spaghetti squashes in the oven seasoned with salt and pepper, and we have our chicken breasts. So you could easily use chicken tenders, you could use chicken thighs, whatever one works best for you. The reason why I like the breasts for this is because you can easily cook them very fast, whereas a thigh takes a little bit longer to kind of break it down and make it super tender, right? And chicken breasts are a little bit healthier for you depending on, on how you're looking at it, right? And in my house, my family and my wife tend to enjoy chicken breasts way more than she does the dark meat um, of the chicken. So. It's just another thing that I can utilize a little bit more of as we go through the day. So I have my chicken breasts that are out. I've pulled them out of the oven early. And the reason why, sorry, out of the I'm refrigerator the early. And the reason why I pull them out of the refrigerator early is because I want them to come to temperature. If I try to cook something that's ice cold in the center, the outside of it's gonna cook, the inside of it's gonna be ice cold. So by the time I actually cook that inside, the outside of it is gonna be overcooked. And again, Whenever I'm trying to eat and I'm trying to utilize maybe less fat or I'm trying to not utilize as much of one ingredient or another, um, any chance I have to overcook something, it definitely um, can end poorly, right? And that's not something that I want. I wanna be able to enjoy my meal um, and want to continue uh, being able to do things along that line. So whenever I'm cooking this chicken, 
I am going to do the exact same thing, right? Season from above, making sure that I cover it completely. And do the same thing with the pepper. And then I'm gonna flip this over and I'm gonna season the other side as a chef that I used to work for once said, why do we season both sides? Do you remember me saying this to you, Lou? No, uh, no, no, I don't recall. <laughs> because we eat both sides, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely one of those wonderful dad jokes, right? Um, so again, yeah. we have our, uh, our chicken that is ready and we're just going to then heat up our pan. We always want to heat our pan first before we add our oil. And the reason being, one second. Sorry about that. <laughs> Anyways, so that being said, we heat our pan first. And the reason being is because we, there's a bunch of like, okay, pans are metal, right? So whenever you heat metal, it expands. Um, so what it ends up doing is as it expands, it creates valleys. And that's why you wanna heat your pan first. So that, that way, whenever you put your oil into the pan, it will get down into those valleys and make it less uh, apt to stick to your, um, to your food, which is one of the reasons why a lot of chefs, you will not see them use nonstick pans that often. Uh, usually on omelet stations at your hotel whenever you're whenever you're out. Um, other than that, you don't see them use them a lot, especially when it comes to seafood, things along that line, you get a much better sear um, whenever you're utilizing stainless or something along that line. So I have my salt and pepper on my chicken breast and I have my pan getting hot over a little bit higher than medium heat. And the way that we're gonna test to make sure that our right. pan is hot and ready, is we're gonna flip it with a little bit of water and you can see it start to jump. And that's exactly what we're looking for, right? So we're looking for question. that jump. Yeah, fire away. Hi. Um, Hi, is there a reason why you're only using salt and pepper for the chicken? Uh, no, you could easily use whatever you would like. Um, okay. Usually, because usually whenever I teach classes, I try to make them a little exotic and different, but I try not to push it too far. <laughs> so. So I usually just do salt and pepper. Yeah, you could use like garlic powder, onion powder. You could use adobo. You could use anything that you wanted. Um, would work extremely well. Smoked paprika as well. Okay. Um, 100%, yeah. So I have it. I'm going to lay the chicken away from me, right? I want to make sure that I don't lay it towards myself. If I lay it towards myself, I'm more than likely going to burn myself. I'm going to lay it away from myself. So... I've laid it away from myself and I'm going to let that sit there and sear in the pan, right? And I have a sheet pan that has a sill pat, which is a non-stick uh, pan. You could use parchment, anything along that line that you wanted. Um, and this is, once the chicken is seared on both sides, I'm going to set it down on here and that's what's going to go into the oven. So we're looking for golden brown and delicious or GBD as we would uh, refer to it in the kitchen. Let's see if I can get you a nice, there you go, a nice little shot of the chicken that's searing in the pan. And I'm using boneless, skinless. Feel free to use whatever you want. You can use chicken thighs, chicken tenders. You can use bone in, skin on. Use a rotisserie chicken and shred it. Um, all of those things are something that you can do with this recipe. But the general idea is to make it as quick and simple as possible. We're going to have a meal that you could easily feed uh, four people with um, in the span of about 30 minutes, um, right? And it's gonna be fresh and that's kind of the beauty of it. And it, whenever you write it out and you read it, it seems like there's a lot of steps. There really isn't a lot of steps. It just seems that way at the end of the day. So we're gonna sear this chicken off, get it nice golden brown on the outside. We're gonna let that keep rolling. So while that is searing, we are then going to jump into our onions and garlic. So onions and garlic. So we have white, one white onion and three cloves of garlic, right? 
So we have our knife that we made our spaghetti squash with, or that we cut our spaghetti squash with. And now we're gonna cut our onion. So we're gonna do what's called a dice, right? So we are going to take the end, this end right here, the pointy end, we're gonna cut that off. And then we're gonna leave the root end. The root end is what's gonna help hold our onion together as we go to dice it. Now, why do people cry whenever they cut onions? It's because onions, when their cells are bruised, it releases sulfur. And sulfur irritates your eyes. So it does it through your olfactory senses. So as you smell in the sulfur, your eyes and tear ducts start to react to that, right? And try to purge it. So what we do is completely shut your nose off and breathe through your mouth. I know it sounds funny, but it's definitely one of those things that will help out whenever you go to cut. So I'm making sure that I've completely cut everything off, cutting through the root end, the flat end is down, and I am going to peel this outside layer off. So I've cut the end of my onion off and left my, left my core end or my root end. I've split it in half. And now I am peeling the outer layer. Have you, you ever heard sure the gum trick? The gum trick, I have not. It's like you're supposed to chew gum while you're cutting onions and it's supposed to help you. I found a better method. You wet a paper towel and you put it on your board um, yep. and that's supposed to attract the acidity of the onions. Yep, it's supposed to attract it. And the same with the little candle. It's supposed to stop the sulfur from going into the air as well. But yeah, it's, it's uh, a lot of times, those have, none of those have ever worked for me. Um, I probably am doing them wrong, which is probably why. <laughs> but the tried and true method that I've, that I've been able to figure out is just by completely shutting it off because it doesn't allow that sulfur in. Also, the younger the onion, the less that it's irritating um, and yeah. the sharper your knife, because if you're using a dull knife, um, it also bruises those cells of the onion a lot more um, and releases that sulfur a lot more. I, I also find, um, I, I wear contact lenses uh, when I'm not wearing corrective. Cheater. Um, and they, they don't affect you. If you, if you so if you're a contact lens wear. Wear your contacts when you touch your onions, and it helps a lot. <laughs> I can't put contact lenses in to save my life. Like it was, I I've tried to get them like four times, and I spend a week. One time, I got one stuck in my eye and had to go back to the eye doctor and have him take it out. Um, but I digress. All right. So what I did with my onion is I sliced it sideways. I then turned it and sliced it like this. I turned my knife and sliced it like this, right? So bam, 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 bam. And what did I do? I kept my hand as a claw. So I did this, all right? So as long as I do this and I never lift my knife above my knuckle, I can't cut myself. As soon as it comes above my knuckle, and there's not much I can do about that. Like, then you're going to cut yourself. <laughs> as long as I don't ever <laughs> stick my fingers out, I will be perfectly fine. That's why chefs can like close their eyes and do this and like chop, yeah, chop onions exactly and everything so fast. Yeah. Yep. And then you can use your thumb to kind of push it back. So that being said, we are going to move my chicken over to my pan. But again, just something to keep in mind whenever you're cutting is to keep everything back. Make sure that uh, you're using fresh onions, right? And also making sure that uh, you have a very sharp knife. Now, dull knives cut way more people than sharp knives ever will. Um, mm. And cutting yourself with a sharp knife is a much cleaner cut, um, and it will hurt a lot less and heal a lot quicker, right? So we have our little lines of onion, basically, that we've created. We've already created our dice. Now we just have to slice through it. So we slice like this. We slice like this. Now we're gonna take our claw again. I'm gonna put my thumb right here on this little uh, nub from the root end. And I'm going to use the, my fingers to guide as I dice, All right? And now just by running my knife through it, I've created these perfect little slices, right? 
So now I don't have to, I keep forgetting that camera's back there. Now I don't have to run my knife through it again. I don't have to do anything else to it. And it's one less bruise that I've done to that onion, right? Mm -hmm. So I've got that one done and I'm just gonna kind of chop that butt end up a little bit. I'm gonna do the same thing over here. And this is what's going to go as some of our seasoning, right? Whenever we go into our uh, spaghetti squash after we shred it. All right. So we've got these little buttons. You can keep them for stock if you so choose. Um, or you can just throw those little buttons in the garbage or into your compost, depending on um, what you have set up at your house. So onion is done. This is going to go right onto this plate right here. Searing that last piece of chicken. I don't want to leave it out. All right, now on to our garlic. So I'm gonna wipe my board down. Let me get rid of my tongs that have chicken on them. Now the garlic. Now you can buy the garlic that's chopped um, in the jar, but remember anytime you cut an onion or garlic or anything that releases sulfur, like in, in the allium family, as soon as they are cut, they start to diminish in flavor. They start to lose mm -hmm. their flavor, which is why if you like buy the jarred chopped garlic, you have to use like 15 tablespoons of it just to even get like the slightest bit of garlic flavor. Um, so I always, any chance you have or can use, just buy some fresh garlic and broke this off of the bulb. And a real quick way to kind of chop it up is, one second, I gotta flip this piece of chicken is we are going to smash it. So my knife is gonna be flat. Please make sure it's flat. Don't turn it like this, it hurts. It hurts a lot. So you wanna keep it flat, set it right on top of that piece of garlic. I'm gonna take my other hand, smash it. I'm gonna do that with all three, right? Again, make and usually sure- usually for myself, when I put the blade down, I usually angle the, the sharp point down towards the cutting board before I hit. Yes, yeah, 100%. Because there's nothing worse than accidentally not angling it away from your hand. <laughs> it hurts. Not that I've ever done that before or anything, I promise. So, and now we've got that skin off real quick and we have these smashed pieces of garlic. All right, so what we're gonna do now is this, we're going to run our knife through real fast like this. And then I'm just going to put my hand on the front part of the blade and I'm gonna rock it like this through the garlic. And again, garlic is the exact same way as onions. The older your garlic, the more pungent it's going to be. And also at the same time, there are different varieties of garlic that are out there. So like a lot of people are really impressed with those big pieces of garlic, like the, the garlic heads that you can get from like your local farm that are like this big and the cloves are like that big around in their mass. It's called elephant garlic. Um, and it sometimes is not nearly as flavorful as some of your smaller garlic or uh, as your stem neck garlic. So anyways, uh, so having your uh, having the garlic that you like. Okay, buddy, tell. <laughs> so my, my dog is biting my son's blanket. So, <laughs> and that's my youngest telling him no. So that's, that's always a plus too. <laughs> um, so depending on what garlic you like the most. Okay, buddy, I'll be there in one second. So depending on what garlic works best for you, it's the garlic that you need to make sure that, that you buy at your local store. Sometimes that big fat garlic is not always the best, right? Sometimes it's the smaller pieces of garlic that have better flavor um, than the bigger ones because they tend to lose their flavor the bigger that they are. So I've seared my chicken breasts on both sides. They've gotten nice and golden brown and those have gone into my 350 degree oven, the same one that my spaghetti squash is in. And those are gonna cook for about 10 to 15 minutes. And by the time that's done, everything else will be ready to go. We will end up pulling that out of the oven at the same time, we'll let the chicken rest. We wanna cook the chicken to about 155 degrees internally. 
Um, and that the reason being is that the chicken will carry over, right? It doesn't stop cooking as soon as I pull it out of the oven. Um, and if I cook it to 165, which is the recommended internal temperature for chicken, it'll carry over way past that and dry out, which is the same reason why people have issues with turkey with, the, with Thanksgiving coming up. Don't ever use those little poppers that pop out of your turkey breast because they're actually designed to cook your turkey to 165 degrees. Um, so by the time you pull it out, your turkey carries the 180, 190, which is why everybody's turkey is always dry. Um, so make sure you use a thermometer, go in between where the leg and the breast connect um, and pull it at about 158 to 162 degrees uh, because you want to make sure that that dark meat and that turkey is also carrying and cooking all the way as well. Just a little tidbit of information while we're at it. All right, so we have our chopped garlic and our chopped onion. Let me see if I can get Diesel to come over here and I can introduce you guys to him. Come here, buddy. He's 45 pounds now, so. Ugh. So this is him. He is my, he's our French pit bull. He is part French bulldog and part pit bull. So he's a, he's a little terror. He's eight months old and he loves to chew on everything he can get his hands on, especially that guy right there. So, <laughs> but that's, that's our little, uh, our, our little doggo that has been an awful lot of fun. So we have our chopped onion and our chopped garlic. We have our goat cheese that's out. Our spaghetti squash is in the oven. Um, along with our chicken breast. Now we have two more things that we need to cut uh, before we kind of do everything else. We have our pepadus. So pepadus are pickled sweet peppers. They also have them in hot. So make sure whenever you buy them, you buy the ones with the black top and not the ones with the red top, unless you want the spicy ones and buy the ones with the red top. That's perfectly fine as well. Um, these are absolutely delicious and they're sweet. They're usually found in your cheese section. Uh, but can also be found with the pickles and things along that line as well, or even sometimes in the Italian section as well, depending on how your grocery store is laid out. Uh, I live in New York, so uh, Stop and Shop carries them. Um, we're also in the Hudson Valley, so we have a chain called Adams. I know you can get them at Whole Foods. Uh, Trader Joe's has them as well. Um, so there's definitely a lot of different places that you can purchase them at. Um, I even think my 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 grandmother is uh, from Ohio and I, well, I'm from Ohio as well. I grew up in Ohio um, that I'm pretty sure that Kroger's carries them in the Midwest as well. So um, there's definitely a lot of different things. And I love these for uh, quick meals as well, because they add so much amazing flavor. Um, and I, it adds a little bit of acidity, a little bit of sweetness, both things that I find great in dishes, especially whenever I'm looking to kind of try to enhance flavors. If I'm not using a ton of butter, I'm not using a ton of fat, or I'm not using a ton of cheese or something else that I would normally utilize uh, to kind of boost flavor if I don't want to make like uh, bacon or, or whatever that may be. So that being said, we're going to take these pepadus. I just drained them out of their jar, out of their liquid. And then what we are going to do is slice these, right? So we're gonna slice them real quick. And again, just however we want, slice them however you want. It doesn't matter. There's no correct way to do this, but making sure that I keep that claw intact, right? Making sure that I'm utilizing my knuckles and my fingers to protect my, the tips of my fingers. So that way I do not cut myself as I cut through. Anybody have any questions or anything they want to ask? It doesn't even have to pertain to this. It can pertain to anything cooking. You're getting ready to cook for the holidays. You have some questions about that. Feel free to fire away. That's what we are here for. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to pound through these real quick. And again, they add a nice acidity and a nice sweetness to this as well. One of the things I started doing during the pandemic is um, I picked up uh, cycling, uh, gravel riding and, and things of that nature. And it has been uh, 
and an amazingly addicting experience. I never in a million years, if you would have told me two years ago that I would be riding 20 to 40 miles a day on a bike um, and doing it with a smile on my face and not like because somebody told me that I would have to do it, I would have told you you were crazy. Um, and now it's, uh, it's something that I actually freak out if I can't do it, um, just because it's, it's a way to kind of clear my head and, uh, go get out and like see the wilderness. It's nice to be able to take, I have a specialized diverge comp E5. I'm able to take it on gravel paths. I'm able to take it through the woods. I'm able to take it out on the road as well. Um, it's been an absolutely amazing experience and something that I'm now very, very addicted to. It's a good addiction. <laughs> Much better than bourbon. Are you, uh, Chef, are you doing a traditional Thanksgiving this year? Or do you, have you set your menu? Or? I have not set my menu. Um, it's one of those things that I usually don't set until like a couple days before because <laughs> my, my brother-in-law's in the city, my, my mother-in-law's up here, uh, my sister-in-law's up here, and then I have a niece and a nephew that I'm not sure when they come in or if they're coming in, and then if they're going to be here at my sister-in-law's. So I usually wait until a couple of days before, but uh, what I ended up doing a couple of years ago is I spoiled everybody and I took the turkey and broke it down and stuffed the legs um, and then sous vide the whole thing and then roasted it and basted it with duck fat. And it was like, I, I kind of went overboard. <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> yeah. now it's like, now it's like every year they come and like last year I was like, well, here's mashed potatoes and a turkey I breast. Like and they're like, what's this? Leg <laughs> Your leg hurts? I'm sorry, buddy. What happened? Um, you know, I guess where I missed both chicken and he played to me with his teeth. Well, if you if you're kicking him, he's going to bite you with your with your with his teeth. Okay, awesome. Anyway. So yes, are, what are you doing this year, Chef? Um, well, I'm gonna be going uh, to Washington, DC to, to my mom's. But I won't be able to get there till until the twenty fourth. Um, okay. So I, we we're gonna do a we're actually gonna do a Gullah Geechee inspired uh, Thanksgiving. So it's a traditional like Aboriginal African American um, inspired thing. So no turkey. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, we, so we're still we're still setting that menu. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else doing anything cool? I'm having my first friends giving, so that's fun. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, I'm having it this Saturday, and I just spent a lot of money at Adams, and I bought like uh, turkey breasts and some le like turkey legs. I'm doing like some air fried uh, turkey wings, and then I'm gonna bake yep. my turkey breasts. So nice, some, like French butter. I like. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Adams is a slight addiction. It and is. It's, it's, really good. <laughs> it's one of one of the most dangerous stores in the world for me to go to on a weekly basis. Oh, I went for like some goat cheese. I left with like three other cheeses. Granted, I have a bunch of cheese for my like charcuterie board already. Yep. It's my fridge can't fit anything else. So I'm really worried about Saturday. Which, uh, which one do you go to? I'm, I'm all the way up in uh, like the Wappinger Falls fish kill area. Yeah, that's where we are. That's where we are. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I'm from Westchester, but I just moved up here. So it's like a new scene for me. You're welcome. Welcome. It's really nice. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I do the uh, the Wappingers one and the truffle Kunick from Nettle Meadow Ugh. is insane. And I highly suggest it the next time you're there. So Kunick, Kunick just as a whole is just a, yeah. It's a, yeah. What is it? So it's a Kunick is a, uh, it's like a soft uh, blooming white rind cheese. It's like a triple, it's a triple cream. Triple cream, I believe. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh no! Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big thing for cheese and wine, so I will remember that. <laughs> you you'll love Kunick then, yeah. And there's a layer of truffle down the middle of it, which is insane. Sounds um, like my type of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so with the uh, oregano, we are going to take yeah. the oregano and we are going to hold the top and we are just going to pull those leaves off. Right? And we're going to end up making sure that we have a couple tablespoons of fresh oregano. And the exact same thing that we have done earlier is we're going to roll everything up and we are going to just run our knife through it as quickly as possible. And with oregano, it's a very tender herb. We don't want to bruise it too much, similar to like a basil. 
So we don't want to chop it. We don't want to run our knife through it a million times because it will start to turn black on us. But we can run through it once, right? And then we're completely done with it. Perfect. All right. So I saw somebody had put something down in the chat as well. Lou, was there? Yeah, they were asking uh, just the name, the full name, the spelling of the name of, uh, of the Kunik. Okay. Yeah, so it's uh, Nettle Meadow, Truffle, Kunik. And I've eaten like three of these in the past week and I have to stop <laughs> because they're like 30 bucks a piece. <laughs> and then you can see this beautiful layer of truffle down the oh. middle of it. Mm -hmm. um, that's and that's a good, good cheese. That's and Nettle Meadow's such an amazing cheese maker that it's, it's well, and their regular Kunik is absolutely delicious, but their, yeah. their truffle is even better. All right. So. We have our spaghetti squash in the oven. Let's check on that and see where we're at. We are very, very close. We are about probably five minutes away from that being done. And then what we are going to do is we'll pull it out, we'll shred it, and then we will make basically a quick goat cheese sauce that we are going to toss our um, spaghetti squash into. Um, and then it's also going to get some kale as well. And again, the reason why we're using goat cheese versus regular cheese, you could very easily use a cow's milk cheese, but the beauty is that with goat cheese, it's a lot easier to digest for humans. Like it's just, it's easier from a, uh, from the type of, the type of casein that's in it. Um, so it's definitely very, uh, it's again, a little bit easier on the gut. It's also usually full of probiotics and there's seven grams of protein per serving, which is always great as well. Um, so just, again, a little bit healthier than your normal cow's milk cheese, but anything that you kind of overindulge in, right, becomes not as healthy for you as well. So you could very easily not add the goat cheese. You could easily just add the goat cheese at the end. You don't have to actually toss the spaghetti squash in the goat cheese. But what we are going to do is we are going to start cooking our onions and our garlic and our kale so that that way one of our spaghetti squash is ready to go. We'll pull it right out of the oven, we'll shred it up, and then we'll toss it right in, ready to rock and roll. We'll put our chicken breast on top, we'll top it with some pickled peppers, and our meal will be done. So in this pan, again, very first thing that I'm doing is I'm heating that pan up first, right? Making sure that, uh, making sure that the pan is hot before I add anything to it. To that, we are going to add two tablespoons of butter. Now, whenever we purchase butter, making sure that we do purchase the healthiest butter we can find, like a grass-fed butter or something of that nature. One, the flavor is insanely better. And two, it's just a healthier form of fat. So we are going to add our butter to that and let it start to melt a little bit. Now, once this starts to melt, we are then going to add our onions. So I'm over medium heat right now. I'm actually going to lower it down to kind of low to medium because I don't want to burn that butter. Brown butter is absolutely delicious, but we don't want that to start right at the beginning. So we are going to, once this melts, add our onion in first. And the reason why we're adding our onion in first is because our onion takes longer to cook. So making sure that we do that first. So that way we do not burn our garlic, right? I have to get the kale from my other refrigerator. So I ran out of space in the other one. So another, um, Another brand that you can get of cheese that I, goat's milk cheese that I really enjoy is Cypress Grove is another company. Yep. Uh, and they make a Humboldt Fall, which is a, a triple cream soft milk cheese. Uh, it's, it's an ash rind uh, aged uh, uh, goat's milk cheese. Very, very good. And then, I mean, since we're talking about goat's milk. <laughs> sheep and, and goat milk nothing. feta from Meredith. Oh, is goodness. the greatest feta cheese in the world. Like in the world. It's from Australia. It's incredibly amazing. It's absolutely insane. So 
we'll talk about cheese all day. Forget everything else. We'll just keep talking <laughs> about cheese. <laughs> um, all right. So I have added my onions to my pan. And what we are going to do is we are going to slowly turn them translucent. It's going to be about three or four minutes, right? It's not going to take a ton of time, but we are looking to make them translucent. What's that? She says she can eat cheese all day. Angela said, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a slight addiction and something that uh, I probably would even have lost more weight had it not been for my addiction to cheese. <laughs> So I do a lot of uh, a lot of live videos, um, either with Chef or or with my my um, my day job, um, and I before I lost the weight, I was doing a ton of them, and then I, I lost all the weight, and then one day randomly I pulled up a video of of me, the very first one that I had ever done, and I showed it to my son, and he asked me who that was. And I was like, uh, that's, that's daddy. He's like, no, no, that's not daddy. I was like, dude, you were, you, it was last year. <laughs> you were alive. Whenever. He's like, I don't remember you looking like that. Anyway. All right. So we're going to, again, slowly turn these translucent. I'm going to turn the heat up just a little bit more. I'm going to check on my spaghetti squash that I always want to call butternut squash. All right, we are ready. And we are going to talk about how I know it's ready as soon as I pull it out of the oven. So I'm gonna get rid of this water just so that way I don't burn myself quicker than I normally would. Close this oven. So the way that I know that this is ready is whenever I push on the top, it's soft, but it doesn't like I, my finger doesn't blow all the way through it. It is, but it's nice and soft because if I was to be able to push it all the way in, then what would happen is I would have overcooked the spaghetti squash on the inside and it's going to turn to mush whenever I go to shred it and throw it back yeah. in the pan. Yeah. So you want there to be resistance, but you can see as, let me go ahead and try to pull it over this way. As I push into it, it my fingers go in and you can still see the divots are still kind of there, right? If they were to not allow me to push in all the way, um, or if they would not allow me to push in at all, then that would be undercooked. Um, and if it let me push in all the way through, then it would be overcooked. So my onions are done, they're translucent. My garlic is going in. And this is gonna cook very quickly. We just really kind of wanna wake that garlic up, give it about a minute or so till it's nice and tender. We chopped it a little bit smaller than the onions. It's gonna give us a little bit more time, a little bit less time is what I meant to say, go very quick. And then into this, we are going to add our kale. While that's happening, I'm going to flip my spaghetti squash over and kind of let it start to cool down a little bit so I am actually able to hold it. So this calls for three cups of chopped kale. So however much kale you can actually fit into your pan because it will cook down. And again, beauties of kale, tons of vitamin A, tons of vitamin K. Um, there are also some things in it that could, that have been thought to help uh, prevent cancer or um, there are also some great things in there as I'm making a mess um, that can help with liver function and Again, just absolutely killer. And, and another thing, just tons of vitamins. Very, very good for you. Um, again, you can eat a ton of it, and it's a beautiful thing. It's also great as chips and all that fun stuff. It's delicious. What's the secret to making kale? Because I, that's like the one thing I'm terrible at making. I've tried making kale. I love kale, but like, I feel like I always overcook it, if that makes okay. sense. Okay. Yep. No, that, and that's, so a lot of people tend to treat kale the same way they treat like collard greens and stuff like that. And they like try to braise them and, and cook a, cook the living snot out of it. Yeah. The, the beauty with kale is that it can just be sauteed very similarly to spinach. Mm -hmm. You don't want to overcook it, especially one of the things you want to make sure you do is that if you see any of them that have huge, big pieces of stem, just take that stem and remove it. 
right? So that'll help out a ton. And just kind of, it's going to have a little bit of texture and that's okay. Like that's exactly what you're looking for with kale. You want there to be a bite to it. Um, you can like put it into soups and braise it and stuff, but I just, I feel that that tends to kind of kill what it is. Um, but yeah, just very lightly saute. Like we're gonna do this, it's gonna cook for a couple of minutes and then be done. I mean, there's also, you know, there's there's different types of kale too. I, I yes. enjoy the curly kale, but that's all I knew growing up. And then, you know, once I got into the culinary world, I found my love for red Russian kale, um, yep. which I tend to to eat raw. Yep. Uh, so a lot of my kales, what I would do is is kind of just um, toss them with with lemon and oil and just really work them with my hands to kind of break down the fiber structure of it to make it easier to eat. Yep. Uh, removing the stems of course as well but luckily the red russian stems are a little bit skinnier so it's 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 a little more palatable um in, in a raw state when i become a huge fan of dinosaur kale or black kale oh yeah um, which also is, known as tuscan yeah also known as tuscan kale um absolutely delicious mm -hmm. um it, it's very very good raw um it also cooks a little bit quicker than like a a, a curly kale does Mm -hmm. um, but again, um, they're all, they're all beautiful and delicious and it's always fun to play around with different types of vegetables, especially whenever you have that, that possibility, right? Is you see something that you may recognize a little bit of, but not 100%. It's always nice to kind of play with it a little bit. Cause once you've cooked one kale, you've kind of cooked them all to an extent. All right. So our the kale is cooked. They kicked in and he pulled that chicken. He, I think he smelled it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I was like, oh no, the, the chicken's still in there. So, so the chicken has been pulled and I know that it's cooked without having to stick a thermometer in it. What I would yep. suggest you do in the fattest part is stick a thermometer in there until it reads about 155 degrees, pull it, and we're going to let it rest. Now, the reason why I know that it is done is we'll show you the chef's trick, right? So as a cook, let me change my can. Actually, you know what? It's going to be yes. perfect right here. So as, oh, as a cook. There you go. Okay. So now I just got to figure out the angles. There we go. Okay. There you go. Yeah. As a cook, if I touch right here without making any form of a fist or touching anything, this is telling me that that is rare. Medium rare. If I touch my finger to my thumb, medium rare. Medium. Medium well. And then if I make a fist, well done. So that as a chef or as a cook, you see a lot of times we will touch the food. And that's telling us where our temperature is at. Because we're used to feeling it and knowing how it feels, yeah. For me, it's... Yeah, we, yep, go ahead. I was going to say, for me, it's, it's kind of like he does that. But, it, but the same thing, it's the same concept of barely, as you touch, no pressure, just touching. And how it feels when you just touch. That's the the pad in between your uh, your thumb and your index. Very helpful. Perfect. So we have our kale, our onions, and our garlic. Our goat cheese is just going to go right into this. All right, and then what we're going to end up doing is this is going to start melting, and while this starts melting, it's going to kind of create a little bit of a sauce for us, and then that's what our spaghetti squash is going to get tossed into. Shower, like your mother said, Hold it, and then we'll deal with that afterwards. Okay, but, all right. So we have the joys of the joys of doing things from our homes, right? <laughs> so uh, we are going to heat up this goat cheese, toss it with our kale, and this is again going to slowly kind of create a nice little melted goat cheese sauce. Now I put eight ounces of goat cheese in here for four people. That's two ounces per which is really not a, uh, it's not an unhealthy amount of, of goat cheese, right? I mean, I don't think that there's ever such thing as an unhealthy amount of goat cheese, but whenever we're talking about eating healthy, <laughs> there may be. Um, so again, we're going to let this kind of warm up a little bit. And it's, you also see that it's taking some of that color off the bottom of the pan. And it's, that's what's called de is deglazing. It's removing some of that flavor, which is not a bad thing at all. So we have our spaghetti squash. And then what we're going to do 
is we're going to shred it. And it comes out just like spaghetti, right? So we're gonna do this. It's a little crispy, which is good or crunchy. That's exactly what we're looking for. That means it's not going to fall apart whenever I dump it into the pan. It's going to hold its texture. It's going to hold its look and it's going to react like spaghetti. And that's exactly what we want it to do. All right. So right in, we have this beautiful spaghetti squash going right in there. We're going to do this as well. So I'm gonna have both of them done. I have, I have three chicken breasts because for some odd reason, Adams sold it in a three pack instead of a four pack. Um, so we're going to use this. It's still a little hot, only, only hurts for a minute. And we're gonna to toss all of this in there. And I'm also going to add a little bit of hot sauce to this. And that's a personal preference for me. You do not have to add hot sauce, but I'm gonna add some Cholula or Hohula or however anybody pronounces it. And we are gonna stir this together. And again, it's gonna add a nice, that's gonna add a nice little bit of heat. And I have this kale, I have that onion, I have that garlic, I have the goat cheese in here now, and it's kind of like a creamy pasta dish, right? But I've done it without utilizing heavy cream. I've done it utilizing a dairy product that is uh, easier for my body to digest, that is full of probiotics as well, right? And it's going to be absolutely delicious cold too. So, the other camera just, went dark. Oh, that's because it says low battery. Good job. Way to go. There you go. There we go. I tried to use my, my other phone and it wasn't working today, so I had to use this phone. So, right. here we go. So, again, you can see we have this beautiful creamy pasta that goat cheese is completely melted in and what we are going to do now is we're going to give it a quick taste because now is whenever it's going to tell us if we need to add uh some salt and pepper or anything along that line always taste before you before you season use a small amount of salt not a ton but it can use some pepper but again, always, always taste before you season because it could already be salty. Um, whenever you season the spaghetti squash, you could have added a, little, a lot of salt then. Um, and you just wanna make sure, or the goat cheese could be salty. Sometimes mm -hmm. different goat cheeses have different amounts of salt in it. So you just wanna be safe and make sure you taste first before you season. Yeah, I think in my past as a chef, uh, my earlier days, the, the majority of my mistakes was because I didn't taste prior and then accounting for salt and things like goat cheese. and. And I had prepared my operation. Parmesan. Parmesan. <laughs> I would always, I would always over season stuff with Parmesan. Um, so now we've added our chopped oregano at the very end. Again, this is a very delicate herb. It's a very pungent herb, but very delicate. Um, so you don't want to add it too early. We're just going to stir this up. All right. So now we have this beautiful spaghetti squash with kale, goat cheese, and oregano. And then we are going to take our chicken, we are going to chop it, and we're actually we're gonna slice it. Uh, we're gonna put that on top, and then we are gonna to top it with our pickled peppers and our dish will be done. So, we have our chopped pickled peppers here. We have our beautiful roasted chicken, all right. And we can switch back to the other camera now as we go through the plate up process. All right. We should be on you. Yeah. So, okay. so we have our, our chicken here. It's rested. And the reason why we rest is that whenever we cook something, we take all of those proteins and we force them together. And what ends up happening is after they're forced together, they want to push out all of their liquid. Searing the outside of the meat doesn't sear anything in. It only creates flavor. Like you're not saving moisture by searing the outside of your meat. So we forced all of our, the, the proteins and everything together. It's forced all of that liquid out. So what do we need to do now is we need to let it kind of rest and kind of come back together, kind of do its thing and pull some of that liquid back in. And also if we were to cut it right now, mid it pushing liquid out, it's just gonna push more liquid out and it's going to become dry. And that's not something that we want to have happen. That's never a good thing at all. 
Um, so it's just one of those things you want to give it a little bit of time to rest and do its thing. It's okay if it's not ripping hot. Um, I actually don't like hot food as a chef. I prefer room temperature food. It's just, I feel like there's better flavor. It doesn't burn your mouth. It don't lose your taste buds halfway through the meal. Um, so anyways, so I'm going to cut at an angle, right? So I'm going to cut what they call on the bias. So just cutting at an angle. And that makes, again, it's an eye thing. It makes it look like there's more chicken going onto the plate than what there actually is. And again, it's also utilized a lot in restaurants and things along that line where um, uh, if you are putting less protein on the plate, you will cut it to make it look bigger. Just a little, little piece of information in case you're at a restaurant and you're like, oh, why is this cut like this? Okay, buddy, one second. We will get the hair for you. So we've got it sliced in some fairly thin pieces and you can see there's still an insane amount of moisture in this. You can see it kind of slowly dripping yeah, down my fingers, it, but it's not it. forcing itself out. It's not like pouring down my hand, um, which means that I've let it rest long enough that it's not letting all of that liquid out. Um, and so that's definitely one of the pluses, right? It's gonna be nice and moist and absolutely delicious. So I have this goat cheese and spaghetti squash with kale. <laughs> He's got a hair that he is obsessed with not having on him. Where is it, buddy? Okay, thank you, bud. He just handed it to me, so he was perfectly. <laughs> anyway, gotta love. I love my. I love my kids. So, we have this right there. I'm gonna take this, kind of spread it around so that it kind of hugs that spaghetti squash with the kale. And I'm just gonna take a nice, good handful of these pickled peppers because I think they're absolutely delicious. And I'm going to set those right on top. So I have this gorgeous chicken breast that's with a goat cheese and spaghetti squash and kale topped with pickled peppers. Now the cool thing about this is that I could easily, for tomorrow, for lunch, I can take this goat cheese and spaghetti squash mixture, I can mix it in with the pickled peppers, I can mix it in with salad greens, maybe some brown rice or something along that line. Um, and then that also will give me another different meal. It's not the exact same meal that I'm eating now. Um, another good cheese that would work extremely good with this blue cheese would work killer with this. Um, you could utilize, I mean, even like a, a cheddar or something along that line kind of melted in as well. Uh, if really good fresh moths, like a burrata, like it's a slight addiction of mine as well. Um, burrata, anytime you take cheese and stuff it with more cheese. I mean, you, you can't go wrong. So um, burrata would be good. Um, fresh mozz, um, literally, I, Limburger, Eplos, literally, like, I don't think that there's a cheese that wouldn't go good with something like this. Um, maybe if you did blue cheese, maybe you do it with uh, grilled steak or you do, uh, you do like Eplos or you do mozzarella or burrata with like some poached shrimp or something along that line as well. And again, the cool thing about this is that you can take the kind of basis of this and create your own different kind of dishes or spins on it. It doesn't have to be goat cheese. It can be cheddar. It can be spaghetti squash and it can be black beans and it doesn't have to be pickled peppers. It can be avocado and jalapenos or you can just kind of take this and kind of build on it. But also looking at it, whenever you're building a meal, making sure that it has a large amount of fiber in there, that it has a good amount of protein and has good healthy protein in there and that the fat is good and healthy for you as well. You're getting a ton of vitamins and that you're thinking about your gut health as you're going through it as well. Um, and again, this is delicious cold. You have it for dinner that night, eat it for lunch the next day and it's not gonna stink up the break room either. Um, so when you pop it in the microwave, you do decide to heat it up. Uh, people aren't yelling at you because it makes the whole place smell bad. We um, work with animals that are always throwing say. up, so it's going to smell a lot better than the actual hospital. I promise you that. Okay. <laughs> true. True. One hundred percent. But isn't that? But if you're in the break room, the last thing you want is to have a smell <laughs> anything like the outside. Anything is better than Parvo Land. Anything better than poop. You have no idea. So I, I moonlighted as a as a vet tech when I was younger, actually. So I know the smell very well. Yeah. <laughs> San Ramon and we have fresh baked chocolate chip cookies is what San Ramon smells like so come visit our hospital oh, awesome. <laughs> <I'm in. laughs> 
So does anybody have any questions for us? Again, it can be about anything. And we'll try to act like we know how to answer them. Uh, yeah. Thanksgiving's coming question. up. Don't be shy. Yep, go uh, ahead. I do have a question. Uh, the spaghetti squash, if you want to make it by itself, what's the best way to not make it sweet? Because sometimes it does come out sweet. Okay. Uh, so do you have any tips for that? So usually whenever I roast it, I, I make sure that I roast it and I don't roast it too much. Um, a lot of times whenever you overcook it or you cook it too long and it starts to get soft like I was talking about, what ends up happening is that also activates the sugars a little bit more and it can become a little bit sweeter on you. So make sure you just slightly undercook it. It'll keep it a little less sweet um, and keep it a little bit more on the savory line. And also if you add stuff like chopped rosemary, um, or, uh, or oregano or some of your more savory herbs mm -hmm. and stay away from some of your sweeter ones, then that also will, will also help to kind of trick your mind into, into not realizing or into realizing it's not as sweet as it may seem. Um, and then also utilizing savory spices um, and, and kind of not get, staying away from your warming spices, like not use, utilizing nutmeg or cinnamon or things along that line and sticking with um, your, your garlics and your onions and your cayennes and things along that line um, should help as well. Okay, thank you. No problem. Any other questions? All right. Well, hopefully you guys make this dish and enjoy it and have fun with it and play around with it and change it up and do all these different things to it. Um, you can reach me um, through my email address at chefbrandonc at gmail.com. Um, and you can also reach Lewis through his as well. Yeah, that's chef Lewis Sheridan at gmail.com. And you can also reach us through chef as well. Um, and we will gladly um, answer any questions you may have um, about food cooking in general, use us as kind of like your personal encyclopedia if you, if you need. Um, if you have any questions, feel free. And also share with us any photos that you may take of the dishes that you create, um, because we always love to keep uh, kind of tabs on what everybody's doing with, 